In this video, I'm going to describe some more advanced techniques that you can use to assess risk, active management, and the style of a fund. I'll start with VAR, or value at risk, which is one of the most important metrics you can use to determine how much a security or portfolio is likely to lose in a given period. Then I'll show you tracking error. Next I'll describe active returns and how we can use them to assess the asset allocation and security selection ability of a fund manager. Finally, I'll go over the basics of style analysis, which allow you to determine the type of investments a fund is making. Of all of the measures I'm describing in this video, value at risk is undoubtedly the most important because it's a fantastic tool for assessing the likely loss on your portfolio over a period of time. We often shorten value at risk to VAR. VAR assumes that our portfolio's returns are a random variable following a normal distribution, although you know sometimes you can change this to a different distribution. Uh, the value at risk represents the amount that we expect to lose if our portfolio's return in the next period is at some lower percentile, like the first percentile or the fifth percentile. For example, VAR of 0.05 indicates the amount we would lose if our portfolio had a return equal to the fifth percentile of return given a mean and standard deviation and the normal distribution. VAR is the gold standard for determining the amount a portfolio is likely to lose in a period. Because it's forward-looking, it's one of our best tools for assessing and managing portfolio risk. Now, let's talk about the calculation of VAR and then I'll go through an example. Now the way we calculate VAR is by assuming that the VAR is the lower bound of a confidence interval. And if you remember your statistics, the way we calculate the upper and lower bounds of a confidence interval is we first identify the mean or the expected return, and then we add to that the Z statistic times the standard deviation, or uh, sometimes we might use the T statistic for a sample. For simplicity, I'll just use the Z statistic here. If we were to look up the Z statistic for the normal distribution at the 0.05 level, what that means is uh, there are 5% of all possible observations below this point and 95% of all possible observations above the VAR of 0.05. So if we look up the Z statistic in, uh, well, any anywhere we want to look it up, whether it's in the back of a textbook or we can actually pull that directly from Excel. I'll show you that in a few seconds. Uh, that value is negative 1.645. Uh, so what we do is we take that negative 1.645 times the standard deviation and add that to the expected return on our portfolio. That's going to give us our VAR of 0.05. If we want the VAR of 0.01, well, we just use the Z statistic associated with the first percentile of the normal distribution, which is negative 2.326. Uh, so what this Z statistic indicates is that 1% uh, of all observations are going to be below the VAR of 0.01, and 99% of all observations are going to be above VAR of 0.01. So that's how we calculate the VAR. Now, there are three primary estimation methods to calculate the VAR. The first is the parametric method. In this method, we assign a mean and a standard deviation based on our own analysis. We can calculate the mean and standard deviation for a VAR based on past return data. So let me give you an example. So in this VAR tab of our Excel spreadsheet, what I've done is I've collected the monthly returns for the S&P 500 ETF. Uh, so I've done this for uh, 60 observations, so five years worth of data. And so for example, in G uh, December of 2021, the return on the S&P 500 ETF was negative 60 basis points. Using this data, we can calculate our VAR. Uh, so using the, the parametric method, what we would first want to do is calculate our historical return. So I'll just take the average return over our historical period, going back to the first month of 2017. Next, I'll calculate our historical standard deviation. 
So now that we have our historical return and our historical standard deviation, we can calculate our VAR. And the way we do that is by using the formula I just showed you. It's this thing. So we have our expected return on the portfolio plus our Z statistic times that standard deviation I just calculated. We also need to get our Z statistic, but I'll use the norm SINV function for that. Okay, so I've zoomed in here, and now let me calculate the VAR of 0.05. I'm going to take our historical return and add to that the quantity of our Z statistic. And since we're looking for the 0.05, uh, the fifth percentile, I'm going to use the norm S in function of 0.05. And this is going to tell me the Z statistic for the fifth percentile. Uh, which will be that negative 1.645 that I calculated earlier, or showed you earlier on the PowerPoint slide. And I'm going to multiply that by our historical standard deviation. And this will give us our VAR of 0.05. Next, if we want to get our VAR of 0.01, we just repeat the process. So, assuming our expected return is going to be consistent with our past return, I'm just going to take our historical return and add to that our norm s inv function of 0.01 times our standard deviation. And there we go. So using the parametric method to estimate VAR, what we have determined is that our VAR of 0.05 is negative 5.95%. And as you would expect, our VAR of 0.01 is significantly larger in magnitude. What the VAR of 0.05 says is that 95% of our observations or our possible observations for the next month's return will be greater than negative 5.95%. And 5% of those observations are likely to be worse than negative 5.95%. And, you know, it's 99 and 1% for the VAR of 0.01. Okay, the next method you can use to calculate the VAR is the historical simulation method. And this method is extremely simple. All you do is sort the historical data and identify the first or fifth percentile. That value is your VAR. So if I have my S&P 500 monthly returns, all I need to do is sort these from highest to lowest, or lowest to highest if you prefer that. So we have 60 observations, and if I want to find the fifth percentile, I just take that 60 times 0.05. So the third lowest observation, that's going to be our VAR of 0.05. And then our VAR, our VAR of 0.01 is going to be 0.01 times 60. It's going to be essentially the, the most negative return. That's going to be our, our uh, VAR of 0.01, the historical simulation method. The issue with it is that sometimes you're, you know, you have to split the difference, and especially if it's, uh, you have something like this where it's less than one observation, uh, then you, you essentially just take the lowest observation. So I'll sort from, we'll do from smallest to largest, and since there's 60 obser observations here, our worst return was, as we might expect, uh, February of 2020, right when the coronavirus hit, negative uh, 13% return. And obviously, uh, we had some other pretty bad returns in there. But uh, yeah, so our VAR of 0.05 is going to be the third observation here, which would be the return right here, the observation that we had on January in January of 2020. So our VAR of uh, at, of 0 0.05 is negative 7.92%. And our VAR of 0 0.01 is our worst observation. So there we go. Very simple method. The final method I'll show you for calculating VAR is Monte Carlo simulation. And you can use this in Excel, but it's much more complicated than the other methods. With Monte Carlo simulation, you need to simulate a certain number of observations based on a mean and standard deviation. And then you take the fifth or the first percentile. So let's take a look. So in my Excel spreadsheet, what I'll do is I'll condense this stuff down so I can zoom in a little. 
our expected return, we'll, we'll continue to assume that our return is just the same as the historical return, and our standard deviation is just the same as the historical standard deviation. Now, what we can do is randomly generate values around this return with this standard deviation. And each of these values is going to represent a trial. So what I'm going to really be doing here is generating 100 simulated values or simulated returns where the mean is this 1.53% and the standard deviation or volatility of these returns is, well, this. So to do that, first things first, I'm going to set my return as my mean and I'm going to lock this in because I'm going to copy down this formula and I'm going to add to that a randomly generated number and in Excel the way you randomly generate numbers is you use the rand function uh, you can also use the rand between function but the rand function is uh, honestly my my preferred go-to so I need to randomly generate numbers across the normal distribution and the way I can do that is by first typing in norm s in and using the rand function rand to generate a random probability. So this is going to be between zero and one. And what that'll do is it'll create a, you know, we'll have a number, let's say it's 0.25. And that 0.25 will in when it's inside this norm s in function, it'll identify the point on a standard normal distribution that corresponds, or the Z statistic that corresponds with that particular percentile. And I'm going to multiply that by our standard deviation. So when I close my parentheses, we will have a randomly generated value. And I can double click down here at the bottom right to copy this formula down. And then notice every time I open this up and close it, all these numbers will randomly regenerate. So you'll have changing numbers every single time. And now, since we're working in Excel, there's several functions we can use to calculate the VAR of 0.05. What I can actually use is the percentile function. And so in the percentile function, all we have to do is highlight our array And our array is just the, the stream of numbers, the column of numbers or the row of numbers. And then I highlight or uh, place a comma and then identify the percentage or the, you know, the percentile I want. So I want the 0.05. And so here, using Monte Carlo simulation, I've found the fifth percentile or the VAR of 0.05 based on these 100 randomly generated numbers. Uh, that follow a uh, normal distribution with a return of 1.53 and standard deviation of 0.0455. To get the VAR of 0.01, I just repeat the process with the same array, and I'll put in 0.01 because I want the first percentile. And there we go. So, yep, it's as simple as that. So we got the VAR using three different methods. Now let's turn our attention to tracking error. Tracking error is the difference between the market return and the funds return. Funds that are more actively managed have greater tracking error. A lower tracking error is usually a sign that the fund manager is primarily holding the market portfolio in the same weights as the benchmark index. If a fund manager claims that the fund is actively managed and is charging a large expense ratio, you might not want to be investing in that fund. Now, to calculate our tracking error, you can take the portfolio's return minus the benchmark return in each period and square the deviations, sum them, and divide them by the number of observations minus one and take the square root of that. Uh, so let's take an example. Okay, so I'm over here in the tracking error tab of our portfolio. And so I'm using the same data that I used for the port examples in uh, another or earlier. And I 
what I have here are 60 months of return data starting in uh, July of 2012 running through June of 2017. Uh, and our benchmark here is going to be the Vanguard Value ETF, and I've collected data or returns on three funds, the SAOIX, the AVPVX, which is an American Century Fund, and the SEVAX, uh, Guggenheim Midcap uh, Value Fund. All three of these are mutual funds. Okay, so if I'm trying to calculate the tracking error of each of these to determine how actively these funds are managed, first step I want to calculate the difference in returns between each fund and the benchmark in the given period. So what I do is I take our SAOIX return in each month minus our benchmark return, the VTV return. And so that's what I've done here. Next, I want to square those di uh, return differences. So I take our uh, differences and take them well, square them. Once I've squared these differences, what I need to do is sum them up and uh, divide by n minus 1 and then take the square root of that. So really, since we have 60 observations for each fund, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sum up all these squared deviations and divide them by 59 because that's our n minus 1. That's 60 minus 1. And then once I have that number, I'm going to take the square root of that. And that is our tracking error. So for the SAOIX, it's 0.0231, AVPVX, 0.0064, and SEVAX, 0.0493. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that of these three funds, the SEVAX is by far the, the most actively managed, whereas the AVPVX is the, uh, it's the least actively managed. So I, I would expect that of all three of these, the SEVAX would have the highest expense ratio because the fund is more actively managed, and the AVPVX should have the lowest expense ratio because they're, they're managing it or they're actively managed the, managing the fund far less than these other two. All right, now let's turn our attention to active return. And active return is the difference between the portfolio return and the benchmark return. We can use the capital E to indicate that these are expected returns. And in this case, our expected active return is equal to the expected portfolio return minus the expected benchmark return. So our E of RP minus E of R sub B. Active weights are the differences in weights between your portfolio and the weight of the same security in the benchmark portfolio. We denote active weights as delta, or triangle, uh, W sub I. And this, this I indicates the security in the portfolio. So, you know, it really just, we're going to have many, many different securities in the portfolio. And so this I is just kind of a stand in for each individual security. We can break down our active return into two components, asset allocation return and security selection return. The asset allocation return calculates the deviations between asset class portfolio weights and benchmark weights. We take the sum of the product of the active weights of each security times the return or expected return on the benchmark. The security selection return represents the active return within each asset class, and we calculate it as the sum of the product of our portfolio weights times the active return or expected active return. While our asset allocation return indicates how well we invested our funds across asset classes, the security selection return indicates how well we selected individual securities inside each asset class. The sum of our asset allocation return and security selection return is our active return. It's our, it's our total active return. Uh, so that's what I have here. Now let's take a look at an example where we'll calculate our components of active return. Okay, I'm over in the active return tab of our portfolio. And so here's our example. We have a portfolio with 50% of our assets in small cap stocks versus 30% in the benchmark portfolio. 20% uh, of our 
assets are in mid caps and 30% are in large caps uh, compared to the 35% weights in mid caps and large caps for the benchmark. Uh, our portfolio in each of these asset classes offers different returns than the benchmark portfolio. What this indicates is that our securities in each of these asset classes differ from what is in the benchmark uh, asset class. So the stocks that we hold that are small cap stocks are different from what the benchmark is holding. All right, so let's go through and calculate our active return. And we'll start off with our asset allocation return. Now, our asset allocation return, first step is to calculate the difference in weights. So our weight in small cap stocks is 50%. Our, the weight of the benchmark is 30%, so the difference there is 20%, and we'll just copy that down. Next, we take that, this is our delta W, and we multiply those weights by our benchmark return, so the expected return on the benchmark. And we'll copy that down. And so the sum of these active weights times the return on the benchmark, that's going to be our asset allocation return. Next, we want our expected return on, well, our, our active return. And to get that, what we're going to do is we're going to take our individual portfolio returns for each weight or for each uh, asset class and subtract the benchmark returns. So our stocks, our small cap stocks, underperform the benchmark portfolio's small cap stocks by 2%. Uh, next, we take our weights in each asset class, so WP, times our expected, our expected uh, active returns. And then we sum them up. And finally, now that we have our asset allocation return, which is positive, which indicates that we outperformed in our selection of asset classes, and we underperformed in our selection of individual stocks in each asset class, our active return is just asset allocation return plus security selection return. So overall, we outperform the benchmark by 45 basis points. The final tool I want to discuss in this video is style analysis. And in style analysis, we use a fund's historical returns to determine how a fund's assets have it been invested. We regress the fund's excess return on the excess returns of several benchmarks or funds. And then we can use constrained optimization to ensure that the sum of all the regression betas is one. Once we do this, the funds with the largest regression coefficients or betas are most similar in style with our fund. Now, I'm not going to ask you to use constrained optimization on our exam, but you should know how to interpret the output of style analysis. So essentially, I'll, I'll go through an example, and I, I want you to be able to interpret the, the output of uh, something like this. So under our style analysis example tab, I have data that's very similar to what I've been using in uh, the past several examples. So I have five years worth of monthly return data for uh, the SAOIX fund, the AVPVX, and the SEVAX. So these are mutual funds. And then in addition to the standard benchmark I've been using, I've added in a couple of additional uh, ETFs and other funds. So we have the uh, iShares S&P 500 growth fund. Uh, obviously, we have the value uh, Vanguard Value Fund. We have the Dow Jones Utility Average. So this is a an index that tracks the performance of utility stocks. Uh, we have Emerging Markets ETF, uh, the VWO. We have the REIT ETF. So real estate investment trusts are going to be included in this uh, ETF. So this this ETF is tracking the real estate market. And lastly, we have the FTSE Pacific ETF. So these are uh, stocks of companies that are usually on the Pacific Rim. Okay, so with style analysis, what we're going to do is we're going to use constrained optimization to identify the ideal betas that minimize our, our the sum of squared errors. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll use this technique, style analysis, on SAOIX. So I'll start off 
getting our excess returns for each of these assets. So the IVW excess return is just the X, the return on the IVW minus the risk-free rate in that particular month. I do the same thing for the VTV and then all of these other assets. Next, I calculate the SAOIX ex excess return, which is again, just our SAOIX return minus the risk-free rate. And finally, or I guess it's not finally, we're about halfway through now, but uh, I, I wanna calculate the predicted excess return uh, for SAOIX. And what I'm doing here is I'm taking the excess returns for each fund or each ETF. And so that's what I have here, say in M2, uh, we're multiplying M2 or the IVW uh, excess return by the value in Y4. And Y4 is our beta. So what I'm doing over here is I'm just plugging in some some betas. I just need some some basic uh, betas right now that we will optimize here in a second. And they have to sum, well, right now they sum to 100%. Our objective is to minimize the sum of the squared errors of the regression by optimizing these betas. These betas in style analysis are going to be our changing cells. So what you see here as our betas will change when we use solver. And so I'm just multiplying right now the each of these betas by the excess return on each fund. And our error is going to be the excess return on SAOIX in each month minus the predicted excess return. And then I square those and the sum of squared errors in of the regression is literally just the sum of all these squared errors. So now I have everything I need to be able to use style analysis. And the way I use style analysis is by using solver. I'm going to use constrained, constrained optimization to minimize our sum of squared errors, subject to the uh, constraint that I want our total beta to be equal to one, and I'm gonna let these betas change. Let's do it. Okay, so my objective cell is the sum of squared errors of the regression, and I wanna minimize that. Next, my changing cells are these cells right here, our betas, and we're gonna subject them to the constraint that this cell, our total beta, must be equal to one. And uh, I'm going to, if we get any errors where we get like uh, something really funky here, I might set additional constraints, but uh, I think we're good to go. So let's solve. And there we go. We have a solution. So let's zoom in on that. Okay, so what you're looking at right now is the result of our style analysis. It tells us how similar the SAOIX fund returns are to those of uh, some other ETFs or funds. And the way we read this is the larger the beta, the more similar our funds, our funds portfolio is to that of, well, whatever ETF or index we have here. So for example, we have the highest beta for the value index, which makes sense given that the SAOIX is, well, it's the Guggenheim Alpha Opportunity Institutional Fund. It's it's a value fund. We have a, a fairly large beta on another S and P five hundred fund. Uh, it's a growth fund, but you know it's it's also consisting of a lot of U.S. firms. Uh, so there's s the same market effects or the same market factors that would affect our our value stocks would probably also affect growth stocks in the same market. We also see a a relatively high beta. I mean, it's our third highest beta on the Pacific equity or the uh, Pacific rim stocks, which makes sense given that some of these can be uh, U.S. stocks on the uh, Pacific coast. Uh, these other things like the emerging markets beta, the REIT beta, we see betas of, uh, betas of zero, indicating that uh, they, 
our style or the style of the SAOIX is not that similar with the investment style of these two funds. So that's more or less what we'd expect, right? I mean, if our, our fund is uh, consisting of primarily value stocks or value stocks in the US, I should specify that. Uh, but that's, that's style analysis in a nutshell. The higher the beta, the more similar our fund is to whatever that, that index or ETF is. So let's summarize what we covered. First, I introduced value at risk, which is one of the primary tools for assessing market risk and the possible loss from an investment over the next period. Next, I discussed tracking error, which indicates the amount of active management of a portfolio. The higher the tracking error, the more active the fund's management in selecting investments. Next, I discussed active returns, and active returns can be broken down into asset allocation return and security selection return. Asset allocation return indicates the amount of active return generated from good asset allocation, while security selection return indicates the amount of return generated from good selection of individual securities inside the asset classes. And then finally, I briefly covered style analysis. When used appropriately, style analysis allows you to objectively assess the investment style of a fund by comparing your performance to that of several benchmarks and other funds. And so with that, I'm going to wrap up this video, but if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, if you don't have questions, obviously, I will very likely see you in class. Thank you.